of my favorite authors is a guy named Brennan Manning. And Brennan Manning was a to say to say this uh, to say this the nicest way possible. Brennan Manning was a very troubled man. <laughs> he uh, he had a lot of demons that he dealt with his whole life, but he understood what it meant to be in Christ, to be hidden in Christ, to be covered. Can you pull that down just a little bit, brother? To be covered by the grace of the Lord that we sang about this morning. He was a man that, he was, a, he was in the Catholic Church, he was a priest for a number of years and had a falling out due to alcoholism and came full circle. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Rich Mullins. Um, he is the one, Brennan Manning is the man that was instrumental in Rich Mullins being Rich Mullins. He, he discipled Rich Mullins um, through some of his darkest times. Um, he wrote a book about it called The Ragamuffin Gospel, which I would, which I would greatly suggest you reading. But um, he wrote a book called The Relentless Tenderness of Jesus. And I, I read this book. I was living in Virginia at the time. I couldn't tell you the year but it impacted me in a way that I realized that I, I, I questioned, after I read the book, I said, I don't even know if I'm saved. <laughs> like, it was one of those like, really good books that just really challenges you. And so this morning, I want to read you a story from that before we get into this message. So Brennan Manning writes, Once upon a time, there was a girl named Jackie who lived in the ghetto of a large American city. She never knew her father. Whoever he was, he was never married to her mother, and Jackie lived with her mother, but never knew a mother's love. Her mother was harsh, cruel, brutal. It didn't take Jackie long to discover the truth about the long line of uncles who periodically stayed with them. Growing up in this kind of jungle, surrounded by bitterness and contempt, Jackie quickly built up a hard shell of self-defense. People were out to get what they could, and if you were in their way, they would trample you. As she advanced into her teens, she became an object of interest for men. But that was just the trouble. She was merely an object, a source of entertainment, a Kleenex girl, they called her, to be used and tossed away. Jackie felt the only way she could survive was to get the world before the world got her. So she turned out, she tuned out, cut off, and closed in. And then one day in the summer, she met, quite by chance, a young graduate student who was working in the ghetto as part of his field experience in social work. His background had been much different from hers. He had grown up with love, understanding, and trust. Consequently, he was a secure man who valued himself not for what he accomplished, but just because of who he was. Peter was a, love, a, loving, warm, oh, excuse me, Peter was a warm, loving person. But when he first saw Jackie... He greeted her with a friendly smile, but she gave him one of those if looks could kill glances in return. This didn't put Peter off. He continued to say hello day after day. At first, Jackie only sneered, but little by little, his warmth and openness began to penetrate her shell. One day, she gambled on a nod. A day or so later, mumbled hi. Still, she thought he was just like the rest of the men that she had known over the years, even though his tactics might be a little subtler but he was simply a nice guy whose heart had reached out with a gratuitous offering of sympathy and compassion. She couldn't believe he was honestly interested in her just for herself, but she began to hope it might be true. A strange transformation began to take place in Jackie's life. Her vulgar language was the first thing to change, followed by a new concern for personal appearance. It wasn't just the externals like combed hair, a washed face, clean clothes. A new inner light started to show itself. As a person, she was beginning to bloom. And his love seemed to be responsible for it all. He wasn't just playing social worker. He was deeply interested in her. He cared. He gave of himself. In her response to his gift of friendship, she was called to an attitude of trust that became very painful. For eventually... She eventually found herself forced to turn away from all her old convictions and suspicions. In a real sense, she died to her old self. The mask, the phony facade, the front she hid behind, all were shredded. At the end of that summer, he told her of his love and forced the issue. She was brought to a brink. If she acknowledged her love for him, she would be opening herself to the risk of rejection. And there had been plenty of that already. 
But after a torturous struggle, she made the leap and surrendered her heart in trust. It seemed that she had abandoned everything else, yet she felt richer for it. She'd become a new person. In a sense, this story of Jackie and Peter is a story that our personal, of our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The attraction is rooted in the beauty and enchantment. The personal magnetism and compelling power of the Master. And his words are like no other. There is no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus said, I call you my friends. Jesus said, abide in my love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and your joy may be filled. He said, peace is my gift to you. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust in me. I'm going now to prepare a place for you. And after I have gone and prepared you a place, I'll return to take you with me so that where I am, you may be too. Jesus says, you didn't choose me. I chose you. <clears throat> what deity of any great world religion has ever spoken with such breathtaking tenderness, incredible familiarity, indomitable confidence, and spellbinding power? We recognize that Jesus responds to needs and desires that we've long had, perhaps without being fully aware of them. He speaks to our innermost being, supplies our needs, satisfies our desires, and in him the obscure is illuminated, the uncertain yields to the certain. Insecurity is replaced by a deep sense of security, and in him we find that we have come to understand many things that baffled us. The encounter with Jesus awakens to us possibilities we have never seen. And we now know that this person is what we have been seeking. Can anybody resonate with me on that? Is, is, is that okay? So if that's the case, in your life, which I hope it is, and if it's not, at the end of the message, Pastor Kevin's going to come up, and I believe that he's going to give an invitation for you to understand what that means. But if you're walking in that, if you're living in a place where you feel like you're a follower of the way, a disciple, when was the last time you shared that with somebody else that needed to hear it? Rachel and I have been, I asked her to come up and share this, but she asked me if I would do it, so I will oblige her. <laughs> Rachel and I have been in a, in a pattern of pressing in in new and deep ways. And we have never been, I'm going to be, on one sense of the word, transparent with you this morning. We have never been more at odds with each other I would say over the last three to four weeks than we've been in the, our two years of marriage. Over what, I don't think either of us could tell you. But Rachel came to me the other night and she said, sweetie, I was praying and I feel like, you know, you're pressing in and I'm pressing in and the enemy's upset. She said, but we're not pressing in together. <laughs> it hurts. And I said, whew. And so I want to declare to you this morning that as I finish this message and, and share this with you, that the goal is not to shame you into doing something. It's not into, into me telling you that you have to fix where you're at. It's me saying that as you decide to become a follower of Jesus, that it's more than Sunday, it's more than Wednesday night, it's more than worship team on Tuesday, it's more than Christian radio in the car, it's, it's every day, 24-7, seven, seven days a week, 365. And let me tell you, as a person that was raised in the church, that has worn every kind of mask and fake smile, amen, brother, glory, hallelujah, everything's perfect, everything's fine, that being a Christian is hard. <laughs> okay? But that's okay. Because when Jesus left the earth. I'm going to skip ahead two slides here. Sorry. 
I can go backwards, right? All right, cool. There we go. Great Commission. Jesus says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you to the very end of the age. Have we all heard that? Okay? We've heard it preached, we've heard it discussed, we've heard it talked about. What does that look like in 2018, October, in Countersport? I've heard that scripture hundreds of times. But what does that mean for us right now? We read it, we glance over it. Okay, Jesus has all authority, I know that. He wants me to go out and make disciples. He wants me to go out and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them everything that he's commanded me to do. And then he gives us a promise, I'll be with you to the end of the age. But what does it really mean? When was the last time that you can say you fulfilled the Great Commission in your life? Awful quiet in here. If I could cue some crickets, I would. This is the last thing that Jesus says. Jesus is standing in front of, he's risen from the dead. He has, he has, he's there in his glorified body and he's talking to his apostles and he's sending them out. He's giving them a charge and he's saying, go into all the world. Make disciples. Teach them about me. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Kevin, I shared this the last time we were up here. Kevin asked me if, Pastor Kevin asked if I would do a triad with a couple of the brothers in the church. It's been an incredible experience. The first week I told him, I said, I don't want to do this because I don't want you to know how rotten I really am. Because when you commit to this triad, you commit to discipleship together. It's not me discipling them. It's not them discipling me. It's us allowing the Holy Spirit to disciple us and us walking through life together. But to do that, things get messy real fast if you're going to do it right. See, because as Christians, we tend to... I apologize if I step on anybody's toes. I apologize in advance. As, as Christians, especially in, in first world countries where we have prosperity and we have vehicles and we, ha you know, we have all of the things that, that we could ever want, we're self-sufficient, okay? The idea of American Christianity become Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights, everything's great. How you doing, brother? I am fantastic. I am wonderful. I'm great. Everything's up. God is so good. Now, all of those things are true. Chris Rohr texted me this week. And I don't know why, but we feel like we should be praying for you guys. And before you as a community, I answered back, things are great, man. Thanks. Thanks for praying. What I should have said was, you're hearing from God. I need you to call me right now and pray with my wife and I because we're going through the thick of it and we don't know even why. I can't even give you a reason. But there was an opportunity for me, a brother that reached out. He and his wife had heard from God. They had reached out to us and I put on a mask and said, we're great. Praise the Lord, brother. <laughs> And the reality is, is, is that if we're going to be open and honest with ourselves, <clears throat> post-salvation experience, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, that he died, rose from the dead, you know, the salvation message. Post that becomes a life of what? Discipleship. And we don't engage in it. Let me try that again. I don't engage in it. We don't engage in it in the way that we, that, the way that we could. Okay? I'm going to try and go back here. Okay. From the book that we're working through in the triad, 
Mr. Ogden says, discipling is an intentional relationship in which we walk alongside other disciples in order to encourage, equip, and challenge one another in love to grow toward maturity in Christ. This includes equipping the disciple to teach others as well. Intentional relationship. What's that mean? Say that again out loud. Doing it on purpose. That's, that's a perfect, perfect definition. Being intentional. Doing it on purpose. I am going to be intentional about having a relationship with you in a way that holds each other accountable, in a way that encourages each other, in a way that lifts each other up. When you laugh, I laugh. When you cry, I cry. When you hurt, I hurt. And when we learn as disciples of the way and the following, following the teachings of Jesus Christ, as we press in, the easier it gets to be transparent with those around us. And so often we want to go out into the world and we want to save sinners and win souls and, you know, crusade. It's great. Okay, it's great. But after that experience, if there is no discipleship, what happens? Five, 10, 15, 20 years goes by and you haven't grown, you haven't changed, you haven't dealt with any of your stuff. You just can claim that I am under the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. And disciples were made how? Jesus preached to the 5,000. He preached to the 3,000. He went out in the boat. He preached. They followed him around. But he had 12 guys that followed him around. The, the mud, the guts, the blood, and the beer. Okay? It's a great country song. But it's reality. They were in the dirt with Jesus for three years. He walked. He talked. He poured into them like, like no one else. So those 12 men, it comes to the ascension. Judas is gone at this point. He, he's there. And he says, listen, you've been with me for three years I kind of feel like you have no idea what you're doing, but I can tell you that you're called to go into the world and make disciples of all men. Okay, the Greek word for baptize, it means to immerse. Okay, now baptism services are incredible. I love them. I, I bawl and snot every time I see someone make that public commitment. But it's more than that. Jesus was saying, go into the world and teach people how to be immersed in me. Immersed in my spirit, covered up, consumed with who I am. And so as we walk out this discipleship situation, I found that I found myself sitting in front of two brothers sharing things that I never thought that I would share with anybody. Things that my wife doesn't know. Because I've been able to be accountable with them to the point that it hurts. To the point that I'm seeing fruit happen, that I'm, that I'm seeing things change, that I'm seeing things grow. What did Jesus say? Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. What does that mean? Can somebody be bold and tell me what that means to them? Somebody that's been following Jesus for a while. What does it mean to deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow him? Okay, put Christ first. Somebody else? That's a good one. Shut off Netflix. Somebody else? Who said that? That's the key. To deny. Not, I'm not going to eat this sandwich because I know that I'm on a diet. More than turning off Netflix. More than, Jesus, you're first in my life. It's deny themselves. Saying, it's not about me. It's not about me. 
Me, myself, and I is my biggest battle. Because at the end of the day, when I'm exhausted and I'm tired, what do I want to do? I don't want to invest in my kids' lives. We, we, let's, can we just be honest? Okay? The kids come home and they want to... The, the other night, Piper wanted me to read her book at bedtime. I couldn't even focus on the words. But yet I could lay there like a slug and watch Netflix after she went to bed. That's discipleship. Can we, get, can we just get real? If you profess to be a Christian and say, it's not about me, you get into a routine of making it about him. Now this isn't a quick fix, perfect thing. This is a day-to-day, well, it says, what does it say, pick up their cross? Daily. Daily. Not once, not at the altar when you confess that you were a sinner and that you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins. It says daily. Okay? Daily follow me. And so in our triad, we're, we're wrestling with, we're into chapter four this week, and we're just dealing with some real life stuff. And I realized that if I'm going to be effective in my ministry, and we all have a ministry, whatever that is, if I'm going to be effective in my job, if I'm going to be effective as a husband, if I'm going to be effective as a parent, if I'm going to be effective in my interpersonal relationships with the men and women that God has brought into my life, that I have to be real with the fact that I am but a sinner saved by grace. I'm not special. I'm not better. I'm not more privileged because I understand that Jesus died for me. I'm not higher or loftier or have more wisdom. No, if anything, I should recognize the need for grace in my life so that I can transcend my mess, so that I can walk away and say, it's not about me. Today, Jesus, it's going to be about you. And once we position ourselves in that place, we are in a proper direction, if I can say, in my opinion, to make disciples. And how do we make disciples? Say that again loud. Can you walk up to a stranger on a street other than really offering them the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done for them? Can you walk up to a stranger on the street and disciple them? I would propose no. The only way that you can fulfill the great commission that Jesus has left with us for all the age is to be intentional about relationships one-to-one, one-to-two, one-to-three, face-to-face, nitty-gritty, in the blood, the guts, and the beer, every day, walking out life together. And I want to challenge you this morning as a community to do that. And this is a place where we do do that. Where this morning, Kevin, Pastor Kevin, I'm sorry, we've known each other for so long. I try so hard to call him Pastor Kevin in public. I, I know you don't care, but I care. <laughs> um, Pastor Kevin, when he asks us to stand up, that's a feeling of vulnerability. Because in, in, in church world, in church, in church games, in church masks, If you go to the altar, something's wrong with you. Uh Uh-oh, is right. If you raise your hand when somebody says, hey, do you need prayer? Something, look at me. 
And if I could ask you and be honest, and I won't, please don't respond, but if, if I said, there's somebody in this room that saw Chip and Rachel stand up this morning and thought, what's going on in their marriage? Maybe even thought, what's going on in their marriage? He's preaching today. I don't know if, I don't know. Oh, what's going on with him? What's going on with the, the Wetzel's over? Sorry, you were in my peripheral vision. That's the only other people that I knew that stood up, so I'm, I'm sorry to pick on you. But I believe that we are part of a community that is not going to perpetuate that attitude. Because I believe that in the, in the growth and the transition that this church is in, that we are about to see an influx of people into this building. Not because it's about the numbers, but it's because it's going to be about relationship. Because people are going to come here and they're going to say, you know what? Whoa, these people really do life, do life together. These people really are about healing, transformation, and mission. This isn't just a bunch of smoke and mirrors and happy-go-lucky. Let's do it on Sunday because it's what you do and then everything's going to be great and we'll do it again. No. This is a community of believers that realizes and is an intentional about living relationally in community with each other. And that is the definition of discipleship. Yes. Yes. When you laugh, I laugh. When you cry, I cry. When you rejoice, I rejoice. When you need something that I have, you can have it. And vice versa. But how do we know about those situations? How do we find out who's hurting? Not in the gossip mill, not in the, hey, did you hear But Did you see the Chip and Rachel stuff? I wonder what that was all about this morning. No, it's about, brother, feel like God's telling me to pray for you. Don't know what's going on. We love you. We're praying for you. That is intentional, relational discipleship. So as I shut this down, I'm going to leave you with a quote from Mr. Manning. It says, there's a beautiful transparency to be honest disciples who never wear a false face and do not pretend to be anything but who they are. My name is Charles Grinnell. Some people like to call me Chip. Some people like to call me Parker. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I've shared it before. I have a temper. I have anger issues. I'm in therapy for it. Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't get so honest with us, brother. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We don't want to hear about your mess. Guess what? You're part of this community, so you're going to hear about the mess. If you think about Chip and Rachel this week, think about Chip coming home and being exhausted and not being able to hold his tongue. Not because he wants to open his mouth, but because he is a sinner saved by grace. And he needs to continually remember that it's his job to deny himself it's not about me and pick up my cross and follow him. And I can tell you I fail more often times than I, can, than I succeed and I would be bold enough to say that I'm in good company. Is that okay? If we're going to be real with each other, we fail more often than we succeed. And you know what? That's okay. Because God has intended through, the, through Jesus Christ, His Son, and the shed blood of the cross, and the grace that covers us, that empowers us to be victorious in our lives only through Christ. Only when we realize that it's not about me, it's not about us, it's not about our purpose, vision, and plan, it's about His. And He said, go into all the world, make disciples. Teach them about what I have instructed you. Love God. Love people. And He said, even unto the end of the age. So this week, as I close, I want to challenge you to be intentional 
about finding a couple people. And you may already have this, but you may not have checked in in a while. Maybe you're already doing it, and praise God, keep doing it. By the grace of God, may you continue on in an amazing and in, in fulfilling journey. But if you do not have somebody that you're yoked up with, men, men, women, women, okay? That's very important because there's confidence. And you have to be, you have to be committed to, you know, loose lips sink ships. What happens in a, in, a, in a discipleship group like that has to stay there because it can destroy. Now, you can encourage that person to take that out of that group and deal whatever, with whatever that issue may be. But if you walk out of that and do that for them, it's going to... It's, 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 just, don't do that. But this week, find somebody. If you don't know what that looks like, call the office, talk to Pastor Kevin, have him explain it to you. Not necessarily to get into a triad, but what it means to be intentional about being relational with somebody so that you can start dealing with the nitty-gritty, icky, weird stuff that you continuously deal with, that you've been wearing a mask and carrying it around, that you don't want anybody else to know about, that you don't want anybody else to have to deal with because they wouldn't understand. They might not. But until you can come to a place of brokenness and emptiness where you say, but God, you will walk around in a circle and walk around the mountain a thousand times until it's time to go home to wherever you're headed. And you will be ineffective. And the commission that Jesus left us was, go into all the world and make disciples of all men. But we can't do that if we won't take off the masks that we're wearing. If we won't stop hiding behind our hang-ups and our, and our shortcomings and our failures. If we won't stop pretending that we can do it on our own, that it's all about us. I'm preaching to myself this morning. I'm a broken man that needs Jesus every day. But I want to encourage us to walk the walk with excellence, to yoke up with somebody that can carry you to the next hurdle and to the next hurdle and to the next hurdle and somebody that will always point you back to Jesus. Amen? So in closing, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for letting me get through this sermon, Lord Jesus. Lord, I thank you for this community of believers that will stand together in unity and faith. And Lord, I ask that we would learn what it is to take off the mask, that you would just continually renew us, Lord, that you would continually disciple us through your spirit, Lord God, that we would continue on together, that we would get yoked up with each other so that we could get ready for what you're doing in the earth. Lord, these are tumultuous times. There's a lost and dying world that needs to hear the truth of your love, but we cannot properly and effectively communicate your love to the lost and dying world if our stuff is still messed up. So Lord, teach us to be interdependent on each other. And may we always point back to you as the Lord and Savior. Lord Jesus, be with us this week. Let us be intentional about relationships. Let us understand what it means to make disciples, starting with our own lives, our own habits, our own patterns. And Lord, I just pray right now for the state of this country, for the division in this country. Lord, that we would be unified. Lord God, that you, your spirit would reign, not because of the right or the left or the evangelicals or the denominational church. Lord, that you would have the preeminence, Lord Jesus. Lord, and that you would continue to renew our minds this week as to the purpose and plan that you have for us right here in Countersport or whatever little town we might live in, right here in Potter County, Lord, that you would give us a clear vision of what it means to be relational where we live. Because then, those people are freed to free more. And those people are freed to free more. And those people are freed to free more. 
And before you know it, Lord God, it's organic and it works and it goes out into all the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.